There's the chicken coop. Here's the greenhouse. And my acreage. There's a nice pond over there. So this greenhouse is 3,000 square feet. It is dug about 10 feet into the back of the hill. And it's intended to have a green roof. Uh, right now I've got it covered with gravel ballast using a uh, geoweb membrane you can see there to retain it. Geocell. Uh, here's a 60 mil LLDPE liner. Below that there's two three inch set, uh, boards of extruded polystyrene insulation uh, for total value of R30. And below that is plywood and then two by tens at uh, I think 16 inch centers or one foot centers. In the back of the hill here you'll see this tube right in this area. This uh, is one of the large um, uh, drain pipes actually from the city of Calgary that I got used for just a few dollars each instead of a thousand bucks each and they run uh, 200 feet. There's two sections actually. So the first section comes in at that end and that's for the air intake because that's west and the west the wind comes from the west. And this here is the exhaust and the exhaust is on the bottom. And so when the exhaust air comes out the bottom it heats up the soil mass that's around the pipes in the ground. The insulation actually comes down um, straight along here and, and out and then the insulation goes down and below it. So the entire section of earth here is enclosed with insulation. There's actually no insulation between the back wall of the greenhouse and this section in an effort to be able to transfer even more heat into that area. Sometimes they're known as um, like a camel nose or in conventional terms it's actually a large heat recovery ventilator. A do-it-yourself heat recovery ventilator. Let's have a look outside here before I take you in. So i got to tie up that loose end of tarp over there but it's a, uh, a double inflated uh, 6 mil polyethylene with the UV treatment. Um, in order to have the overhang, which is an architectural feature that I wanted, I had to be able to have a temporary roof. So I've got a large X billboard PVC high quality tarp that I've put on there that I can just roll back when I need to change out the film, which will happen uh, about every five to ten years, depending. Um, using uh, polycarbonate, rigid polycarbonate, would be much more expensive. I think this plastic costs about, I don't know, maybe seven or eight hundred dollars for all the plastic. Polycarbonate would have been about thirty thousand. So that's not sustainable because sustainability takes into account economic considerations as well. And this model greenhouse is designed to be affordable, to be reproducible. So these are uh, otherwise destined to be telephone poles that were pre-stripped. I thought about getting tamarack due to its uh, rot resistance properties and stripping my own logs. They don't make them this, or sorry, they don't grow this large of diameter that often, the tamarack. Um, and stripping would be a lot of work. So I worked with some log home contractors. I gave them this design, which I had sketched out on graph paper and said, can you guys help make me this, uh, this structure? And then I framed and built um, basically everything else. This uh, front wall was actually a bit of an interesting consideration. So the greenhouse itself, is a 50 foot long greenhouse that's cut in half right along the ridge line. Cut all, I actually took a grinding saw and cut all these last pieces all the way along and then I used joist hangers to attach them. Anyway I took the uh, 50 foot long greenhouse 30 feet wide and I cut it in half to make it 100 feet long and 15 feet wide and then the greenhouse itself was kind of at an angle like this and I decided I wanted it to be steeper for shedding snow and so I just turned it like this and then right where that bar ended up being I put some marks and decided that's where the front wall was going to be. So it wasn't pre-engineered, it was a bit of a, an organic design. This greenhouse will have an annualized geosolar battery. I'll have a large um, ductwork intake along the top and that will come to a central point, filter down to uh, two large IBC totes, those thousand liter totes. Uh, they'll ask as the manifolds for uh, distributing the air into these um, earth tubes. So these are buried between two and three feet below the grade here, as you'll see, uh, one stacked on top of each other. I would have had them 
a bit further apart for better distribution than, than on top of each other with just a, a foot of soil between. But man, that trencher that I had here is difficult to get trenches very close together. And, and, and curved bits like this, and the chain falls off. It's fun, fun, fun. Um, so there's the earth tubes I was talking about. This one is the exhaust, so that's on the bottom. It takes all the warm out air out all the way along that way. By the end, it's transferred most of its heat. And that intake actually starts at this end, and the air comes all the way along in for the intake and is warmed by the mass of soil around it, and of course heat rises. After this is all complete with the manifolds, I'll be installing two, I think like, I don't know, 2,000 gallon, like really big, from basically uh, like 10 feet tall and five feet wide, big black cylinders for storage of water. The roof has a water, water uh, entrapment system for rainwater collection. The pipe will come in here and fill these, these two. Being black, they'll have a large thermal mass. I may have to empty them in the winter. I'll talk about annual considerations later. Um, but uh, those, are, those will be there. In addition, I've got about probably 40 um, steel uh, black barrels. And uh, those are going to be lined all the way along the back here. And then there'll be two rocket mass heaters, one uh, closer to each of those posts with cob benches extending out each way for um, additional thermal mass retention and, and uh, redundant and synergistic heat storage systems. So there's a couple of different things we've got going on here. Um, the front is going to have raised beds, uh, starting at about this level, coming out and down, and then the back will similarly be staggered up. Uh, these types of structures go by uh, a number of different names. I think bio shelter, passive solar greenhouse, there's a few other ones. Um, I'd, I'd like to have a food forest in here ultimately. You see I've got a lot of height and so I can plant um, some taller growing trees in some, some areas um, for ambiance as well as, as for um, hopefully for some productivity. Um, I'm also considering installing some LED grow lights to be installed right along the roof line um, hanging down. I wonder if I have a better perspective. So I install the lights along the line and I make a mezzanine level um, along these these top ones to uh, to have some additional area. I do realize that that does cut out sunlight for some of the growing in the back and so um, perhaps even just in this section over here would be a better area to do some uh, some grow lighting. Other than that, that's a pretty comprehensive overview of the greenhouse. Oh, the other thing I wanted to check. I think outside it's like minus 20 right now. And uh, I've got these temperature probes all over the place. I've got one outside got one right down there on the pole, a couple right up at the top of the poles and around. And uh, I've been monitoring temperature in here with this, uh, this temperature gauge for many months, actually almost a whole year of data I've got. Let's see if I can make that big enough to see. Well, it says it's only minus six outside right now. It's, it is definitely cooler than that outside. And it uh, is nine or 10 in here. So that's pretty good. That's a close to a 15 degree differential, which is, which is pretty standard. Um, I don't know if you can see the graph of the, what, what things, the way things happen at night versus during the day. Um, had a couple of cold snaps around. You see it got down to minus 36. And it only got down to about minus 12 in the greenhouse. So that's kind of cool. Um, greenhouse line is definitely um, more tempered. With the, uh, with the addi additional heat transfer, um, technologies that I've mentioned earlier, I think we'll be able to level that level that out a lot better because it is an annualized uh, geosolar battery and a, and a heat sub subterranean heating and cooling system. And so the cooling aspect is very interesting. You'll note that I have no exterior air vents coming in. I mean, that may change. I've got these large fans from uh, the city of Calgary. Actually, they were for the fire department. I got them for 10 cents on the dollar and they're really high powered fans. I've got six of them. So those are the ones I'm going to use hopefully in my HVAC system as well as I could pop one of those in here if needed. But the idea is, is that with the warm, moist air being accumulated at the top, being sucked underground, it'll induce a phase change from gaseous state water to liquid state water, which transfers a lot more energy than just changing the water's temperature in and of itself and within its own state. Um, latent heat uh, transfer, look it up if you're more interested in it. Um, but in doing so, that will actually have the air come out much cooler and much drier, transferring the heat in the summer, which is great, cooling things down. Um, then in the winter or in the evenings, shoulder seasons, etc., um, it can be um, uh, air can be transferred through, and uh, the opposite occurs. So that that uh, moisture and that heat that's underground will then transfer from liquid back to gaseous state, and um, 
the air will emerge much warmer. Actually, I'm not sure if it will induce a phase change. That would require boiling almost, but nevertheless, there's all that heat that's under there, and you're you're, you're pulling that back out. So I think I'll leave it at that. Maybe I'll just turn and give a view of me, Jeff Rempel, the mad scientist in sustainability, Philico Environmental Consulting. Got to do a little plug, I guess. Um, yeah. Thanks for your time.